I heard a story about Palm Sunday once. A uh, young man woke up Palm Sunday morning, family was a church-going family, got up to go to church, and he wasn't feeling so good, he had a sore throat, so he asked his parents if he could stay behind with a babysitter. And so he stayed behind, and the family went off to church, and they did their thing, and they came back waving palm trees, or having little palm, remember little crosses made out of palm trees, and as they walked into the house, the young man like looked at his folks and kind of said, what's that all about? What's going on? What did I miss out on? So his dad went on to explain that actually um, when the people saw Jesus coming through the crowd, they all waved their palm branches, to which the young man looked at his dad and very disappointedly said, well, wouldn't you believe it? The one weekend I choose not to go to church, Jesus shows up, and people... <laughs> That's good, right? Some of you might need to just tap your neighbor and explain what just went down. But how many of you are excited that Jesus shows up every weekend? I'm so grateful for a church that says yes to what he brings every weekend. It's Palm Sunday. And, um, you know, sometimes in the calendar, we just see that word come up. We're not sure what it actually means. And I, I want to kind of pause in this moment and teach a little bit around Palm Sunday if I can. I, I definitely won't get to all of it. But hopefully just bring some light on the story of Palm Sunday and uh, encourage you today. The title of my message is simply Palm Sunday, A Story of Triumph. I'm going to start in Zechariah chapter 9. And I'm going to get you young guns ready for an awesome week ahead as you get expectant for what God's going to do. Zechariah chapter 9 says this in verse 9, titled, The Coming of Zion's King, Palm Sunday. This is a prophecy by Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, listen to this, your king comes to you. In every other world religion, they go to their king. In the story of God, the kindness of God, our king comes to us. Righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, the fighting uh, men, the war horses from Jerusalem. The battle bow will be broken or bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. Our king comes to us and our king brings peace to us. This is Palm Sunday. This is what the day is all about. A reminder that in this moment, a greater king came to his people. Uh, every time we attempt to please him with our ways, God just reminds us another story started with him coming to us. And he comes in peace, not in war. He will extend his rule from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. This is a prophetic word that was given to Zechariah, and what I love about it is this was a season where Israel's people had been through many kings. They had asked God, give us a king. We want someone to rule and reign in our lives. We don't want to just associate with you as God up there. We need someone here. We need leadership. And so God gave them a king like they asked, and they went through a myriad of kings. You know the story of the Old Testament, and none of them actually lived out to kind of all the things that people wanted of them. Kings always fell. And so they're in the season of silence, and the prophets come to say, the real king's coming. And he's not going to come from you. He's going to come to you. Because you won't produce in human effort what only God can bring by rule and reign. Amen. Church, I'm going to preach about a God, a king that comes to us and brings a different kingdom. This Palm Sunday, I want, to be, I want to remind you that no matter what your world looks like, no matter who you've looked up to or sought for help, or these are all good things. But I want you to know that in the story of Easter, and in fact, Palm Sunday is the start of the story of the Holy Week, a king comes to us. He's not from us. He's for us. And there's something in that narrative that Zechariah gets and he prophesies and he says it's going to happen. What I love about it is it happens. Everything God says, he sees. That's why you can trust him. And so in Luke chapter 19, it's in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But in Luke 19, he tells the story, the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. Jesus had been living on the earth for some time. He had been ministering. People were aware of him. He had been doing amazing things. And now it's come to what they call the Holy Week, uh, just before his crucifixion. And Palm Sunday is where we pick up on Zechariah's story in the New Testament. So Luke chapter 19, verse 28 says this, The triumphal entry, story of triumph. 
After Jesus has said this, he went on up ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, I've been there. It's beautiful. The city of Jerusalem lies in front of you. There's a valley, the Kidron Valley before you. And Jesus is about to go through the valley and into the temple and about to do something that no one else could ever have done for us. And just before he goes into the village, he sends to, verse 5, sends to, sorry, 29, of his disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there. Remember Zechariah's prophecy? Which no one has ever ridden. That's how we know it was the fulfillment of prophecy, because Zechariah said, there will be a donkey and their young. And Jesus says, I want you to go, and there will be a colt tied there. It's the young one that no one's ever ridden. In other words, there's two. Take the young one, the unlikely one to use. We're going to preach a little bit about that today. Untie it. Shout untie. That's what God wants to do in your life today. And bring it here. And if anyone asks why you're untying it, just tell them simply the Lord needs it. <laughs> Don't you love that? Like go and steal someone's donkey. Am I allowed to say that in church? I'm not sure that's exactly what the Bible is saying, but I'm just going to go with it the way I read it. Go and take someone's possession and just let them know this is for Jesus, bro. That five million rand is no longer yours. It's not Jesus's. I'm taking it and I'm putting it to good use for Jesus. And every business person said, 10%, eh? Come with your tithe this morning. Yeah. Verse 32. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, as it said, Why are you untying my animal? They replied, The Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus. I don't know what happened between then and there, but they got what they wanted. Like, there's something God does when we just let Him use us. Like, if we just, like, God, just whatever. We're in. And, and, and if you just let him have his way, his way is far greater than ours. Amen. And so now the, now the cult is ready to be ridden into the town and to the story that most of us will know as Palm Sunday. It says, verse 37, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully, I like that word, joyfully praising God in loud voices, like Link Church on a Sunday morning. If you came this morning a little bit loud, I just want to welcome you to the invitation to celebrate God with the lungs, the breath that's in our lungs, with the loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. I like how Mark said, even the small ones. We sing for just the small things that he does in our lives every single day. You and I just being here together this morning should set us apart to go, God, give us a moment to sing. We want to thank you one more time that we're still here, that the story of our lives is still being told, and that there is breath in our lungs. And then they sang the famous words, blessed is the king, the king, who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples, for they make a racket. Tell Link Church to keep quiet. And Jesus said, I tell you, if Link Church did not sing, I'm just paraphrasing, doesn't really say this. Those of you who don't read your Bibles, Link is not in the Bible. <laughs> it's just a name we thought up. Jesus is the real thing we're doing here. But in any case, he says, if Link do not sing, I, I reply, the rocks will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And said, if you, if, if you, even you, had only known on this day what might bring you peace. He weeps over a city in turmoil. As he thinks to himself, if only you could see where peace comes from. And while he's considering what he wants for the city, which is peace. Don't you just love that about Jesus? He weeps for what he wants for them as peace. Not because what they're doing is wrong. He's never in there to prove what we're doing is wrong. We intuitively know that. He's there to make it right, to bring peace. And he says, oh, my God, my heart burns for these people to know the peace that I bring. And I thought, how cool is it that while he is desperate praying for, looking for the peace of his people, his disciples are praising which is to suggest that peace is ushered in when the praise of God's people is heard. 
which is to suggest that as we sing on a Sunday morning or on a Tuesday or on a Wednesday or when you climb out your car on a Thursday about to go into the boardroom meeting, when the praises of God are on your lips, say, hey, this is what I've figured out. I don't want creation to do the work I was born for. Like, I'm okay that creation is beautiful and breathtaking and captures us. And any, but when it comes to singing the praises, I want in on that part of the story. Amen, Link Church. I don't want anyone else to do the, the thing that I was born to do. You were born to sing. And as his people praised him, he, he pursued and he cried out for the peace of those who didn't know him. And he's still doing it today. And every time we sing and every time we gather and every time we come together, there is a there is a kind of cry from heaven's heart for peace to come upon people again. And maybe today that's you. Maybe today God will bring you what no one else and no other attempt ever has in your life before through Jesus. And so I want to give you just two big thoughts from the scripture. There are so many. This story is full of excitement. There are two big thoughts that I want to bring you to you today. And the first one is you just got to trust him. The story of Palm Sunday let me give you some context. Palm Sunday happens on a Sunday, we believe. Uh, we might be out by a day. We don't know exactly what's going down, but we believe it happened on the day of, the, of, of rest, all right? And so in Jewish culture, maybe that would be the Sabbath, but it happens on a day of rest. And Jesus walks into the city. Peace comes on the day of rest. In other words, human effort can't bring what only he brings. And so he shows up in the city, but the significance of it is really beautiful. And I want you to get this. In the Old Testament, we read a story of Passover where God's people are set free, where the angel of death, we told, passes over the houses. And the whole thing was, if there's blood on the doorpost, let the people go. Now, that was a picture of Jesus to come, right? Everything in the Old Testament is just a shadow of the substance, of the true story, the best part of the story which we have in Jesus. We read it in hindsight. And so what they're doing is they're about to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. And on the first day, or at least the first day of what they call the Holy Week, Jesus shows up. Now, in the Passover, what they would do is they would take a lamb into the home. And they would, they would inspect that lamb for four days. I'm just going to give you some nuggets that help you see this story is so much bigger than a simple little leaf waving on a, on a Sunday morning. Jesus, or the lamb, would get given to us, and they would expect it for four days. They want to check this thing's good to go for sacrifice, right? Old Testament practice, you and I, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And so they would inspect the lamb. So day one, let's say he comes in on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all right? Then on the fifth day evening, they would then take the lamb in for sacrifice, Friday. Are you tracking with me? This week, Good Friday, we will meet to celebrate his death for our life. Jesus came into Jerusalem, friends. Everything God was doing, there was detail in all of it. And the crowds are praising, and the people are celebrating, and others, and Jesus weeps. He said, they can't see what's going down, but we get to look back and see, this is the lamb. Came into the city, was inspected. Nothing wrong with this man. And on Friday, voluntarily, they didn't kill him. He put himself up for death. Voluntarily, he presents himself to be set apart so that you and I could live forever. Saturday, Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, day of rest. He enters in his strength so that we receive peace and resurrected again on the day so that we rest in his resurrection. This is what's going down. So when I say you can trust him, it's because what he sets in motion, he sees. Where God says something, you will see what he says. Now, he's not like us. Come on, let's be honest. Like, we often say things with good intent, even, even kind of Christian things with good intent, but our words don't carry the weight his word does. And so when God says something, he sees it. So when he puts his word in Zechariah and says, there'll be a moment where I walk into town on a donkey, and I will bring about a peace for my people, and I will take down the strongholds of war, and I will introduce a time of peace. When he says all that, there's a reason Jesus, some hundreds of years later, shows up, walks into town on a donkey, just like God said through Zechariah, and he walks into town and he weeps because they can't see the peace that he was promised to bring. But we can Tap your neighbor and say, we can. And so we choosing to trust him. There's something about Palm Sunday that invites us back into a story of trust. Just trust him. And what he says. I love how he says to his disciples, go and untie the donkey. It's waiting for you. And they're thinking, what? They had reference to Zechariah. They would have known, okay, it was prophesied. Something was going to go down. But the fact that he's actually asking us to do it, are we sure? And you know what they do? 
they just go and do it. Like if God has put something in your spirit, if he's like knocking on the door of your heart, if he's nudging you to take a little step, can I give you some encouragement today? Do it. Just trust him. Because in trusting Jesus, in doing what he called them to do, in just following his lead, finding the cult, untying the cult, bringing it back to him, letting him do what he is set apart to do, not what we are set apart to do. Just give him permission that this is his story. When they trusted him, so peace walked through the city. Friends, let me tell you, if you just trust him today, peace is going to follow whatever decision you make. Not the ones you made because you wanted outcomes, but the ones you made because somewhere inside you, he was, he was stirring you. He was, hey, my boy, let's, let's go left here. Let's go right here. Let's make that phone call here. Let's, let's choose this. Let's trust that. Let's be more present in that. Whatever it is, when you trust him, there is peace. This was a donkey, we told, that had never been ridden. A very unlikely story to work out. And God is still riding the donkeys of our lives, the things that we don't think he'll ever use. God says, trust me with that part of your life. You're like, God, you don't want that part. It's untouched. It's unused. It's, it's a little bit weak in its character. You don't want to know about that part of me. Give that part of me. Give that part of you to me. And, and he uses these things. And so, and so just trust him. Shout out trust. The Christian story is not about activity. Coming to church, reading the Bible five times over, singing the song that Dill said we should sing because we're loud. It's about trusting Jesus. That's where the power is. Trust Him. I'll never forget as a church, you may know the story, but a lot of new faces here on the North Coast. Welcome to paradise. And um, when we were a young church, we had about 30 people in the room. You may know the story. We call it the white envelope movement. And I remember we had about 30 people coming to church, baby days. It was honestly, we didn't even know what we were doing, where we were going. And there was this moment we were praying as a team one week, and, and God said to us, I want you to clear your bank accounts. And we said, God, we don't have much of a bank account. There was 30,000 rand. If I'm honest, it was like 29,450, okay? And he said, I want you to clear your bank account. We're like, God, we, we don't really have one. <laughs> but um, all right, so what else do you want us to do with it? And it's, it's just things that he put in our hearts. So I want you to put it into envelopes, white envelopes. I want you to put 500 rand in 60 white envelopes. And this weekend, and word must have got out, I'll be honest, because we only had like 30 people in church. 60 people showed up. Someone must have known, we're giving money away. <laughs> this weekend, I want you to give a white envelope with 500 rand to your church and tell them that there's more in them than they realize. And this is just going to activate a greater sowing in the life of your church. And we're like, okay. All right, God, 30 grand. I mean, we were hoping for like a new speaker, a little projector, like something nice, you know? And uh, that weekend, we cleared our bank account, true story, and we put 60 envelopes of five Moran in our people's hands, and we said, God has entrusted you to change things with what he's put in your life. Go with that finance, this is just an activation, and sow it into someone's life. Like, we're the church, everyone's like, yeah, we're the church. I'm like, now be the church. Take what God has given you, and go and be a blessing, and ask him to show you where to give it. And so people did. People, uh, some would give it to Perhaps some of them were to the domestic workers or to the children that pay for school fees. Some helped them with burglar guards and houses. I'm just remembering the stories. Others would stop and see someone and just feel God had led them to bless them. Some people gave it to people that had more than enough, but God was showing them that he has more than they more than enough. And others would buy f uh, food for their families or treat their wives to a date that they hadn't done for so long and it was just permission. And, and so the stories continued to come. It was beautiful. Children even took on that narrative and they got into their schools and their friends were like, what on earth? And they would take it home and the parents would say, you saw us through our children and we needed this. And, and the white envelope movement started to happen and, and people started to talk. And you know what happened that day? Our church learned something that in the world, we talk about buying and selling, what we can produce in human effort. In the kingdom, we talk about sowing and reaping. When we sow, we always reap. And that weekend in Link Church, we didn't give away 30,000 rand. We sowed into a community. And what it unlocked in our church was a very generous people that if you've just arrived, have paved the way for much of what we sit in and are a part of today because we learned that sowing matters. Trusting Him matters. It's a cool story to tell. Now everyone thinks, that's such a rad story. You clear your bank account. Give that one a go. <laughs> and Jesus was saying to his men, whether it's untying a donkey that somebody else owns or clearing your account 
or just taking a step forward in faith because to be true, you're watching this whole story unfold and there's a bunch of friends that are doing this Christian gig and you like some of their stories and you don't like some of their stories, but actually God's knocking on the heart of your story and maybe today is not about clearing your bank account and it's not about untying a cult that you've never seen. It's just about taking a step and trusting Him with your life. Palm Sunday reminds us the King is in town. He's come to you and if He's knocking on your heart, respond because therein lies the secret for peace. Second thing I want to talk about is transition. Palm Sunday is a story of transition. Give us a king, God. Give us a king, God. We don't like that king. We want a new king, God. Give us another king. Give us another king. I write silence and the prophets start to speak. There's a king coming, but he's not the one that comes from you. He's the one that comes for you. He's not going to come from within the broken parts of humanity. He's going to come in the fullness of heaven. And he's going to come riding into town. This is how you'll note him. On a donkey. Donkeys are symbolic of peace. In the Old Testament, what kings would do is they would load donkeys up with precious possessions as like a truce offering to the enemy. We're done with war. Here's a donkey carrying Jesus, the most precious thing you could put on a donkey. To say, we're no longer at war. This is time of peace. In fact, so beautiful, the, the similarities are so precious. When David hands over to Solomon as a father to a son, it says that he uses a donkey to transition the leadership of kingdom to Solomon. And guess what? It says David was a man of war, but Solomon will be a man of peace. Little details in the story that just remind us when God says he will do something, he's going to do it. And he said, I'm bringing Jesus and he's coming to my people and he's bringing peace. Friends, there's a transition taking place. We don't fight for our status in what God thinks of us. We don't prove ourselves. We don't have to show everybody how much we love Him. We just need to receive how much He loves us. Palm Sunday was setting in motion a new season for people. Easter and Good Friday and the cross of Calvary would be the sacrifice once and for all. Never again would a sacrifice have to be offered. Never again would a lamb have to be checked for four days. Never again would any of this have to happen. By the way, friends, the temple in Jerusalem, it's gone. You can't offer sacrifice on a perfect work. And Jesus came to finish it. And there's a transition that has to take place in our lives. I'm going to hang here for a moment because I think it's going to help some people. Where we untie the things that are restricting the life God has for us. I sent my friend Rory Dyer a message this morning. He's like a pastor to me. And I said, Raw, is Palm Sunday and preachers around the world are going to preach on a whole bunch of stuff. I know they are. But I want to take a moment before I preach to thank you for untying the young cult in me. I was one year into Link Church. I was fighting, man. I just wanted to be a good pastor. I just wanted to build a great church. I wanted to be a good husband and a good dad. Anyone ever felt like that? I just want to be a good businessman or businesswoman. I just, I just want to be a great mom. And, and you're fighting and you're tussling. And, and Rory came into my life, I promise you, friends, as a friend, as a pastor. And he showed me a different king. And I said to my message, I said, thanks for untying that stubborn, um, immature, slightly weak young cult in me and putting me to use so that my ministry could carry a king of peace. Because the truth is, to that point, I think my ministry was more war. Like, God, just that person just shunned down by shit. I just, I just want to fix them, you know. Just want to fix that person. Hey, someone told me, you never believe who came to church today. I'm like, I'm ready for it. Show me where they are and talk straight to them. Back row, left, third, got you. <laughs> hey, people are worshiping. I'm just staring down. Back row, third, left. We're not going to leave this room because I'm warring. I'm warring. You need to, you need to do this thing. You, if you don't, if you can't. And then, I, and then I realize he's a king of peace. And grace is sufficient in my weakness. And the same God. Hear me, church, the same God that walked into this city that was in turmoil and I should in peace was asking me to preach him to people. Not what they should do, hear me loud and clear, but who he is for them. And our ministry started to change and I hope today that your ministry changes too. 
What do you mean by ministry, Dill? I mean your business. I hope you transition it. I mean your own life is a ministry, just by the way. Whenever someone says, Dill, I feel called to full-time ministry, I said, that's fantastic. So is every person that's ever given their life to Jesus on the planet. She says, no, I just feel called to more full-time ministry. I said, oh, what you mean is church work. It's just one part of ministry. Actually, business is ministry, and mothering is ministry, and political service is ministry, and God... And I believe today God wants to transition your ministry. Palm Sunday and a story of triumph. Write this down. We can't triumph in what we haven't untied. We cannot triumph or experience the fullness, the joy of triumph in what is still tied up. My marriage that I'm not willing to let journey with someone else is still tied up. Is my marriage. This is my, this is my, and you're hurting and it's sore and people intuitively know it, but they're scared to get there because you're protecting it. Hey, I've been there. You're just like me. We're humans. Welcome to the club. But when it's there and it's protected and it's tied up, guess what? It also lacks the ability for transformation because transformation happens when you untie the things that are precious for you and, and to you and you give them to Jesus. When that king rides on the things that he's entrusted to you, friends, peace comes. And maybe it is marriage. Maybe I'm speaking to some people today. Maybe it's parenting. I, I don't want to seek any counsel from my kids. I'm just going to go through the pain of watching when their decisions repeat themselves again and again and again without asking a single friend or, or a church community to pray for them. I'm fighting this war on my own. That cult is tied up. I want to help you today. Untie that young cult. Give it to Jesus. Present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through knowledge in Christ Jesus. What's the knowledge? He's a king that brings peace. And when I untie things that are precious to me and I put it into the person of him friends peace comes if anyone is watching this online and i know you will because youtube's awesome like that it lands up all over the show i want to tell you the political system globally is in turmoil and people are panicking people are panicking and we're desperate for a person to shift the panic but it won't happen. Men and women of peace will shift the panic when the church starts to untie the parts of their lives that have been set apart for His glory, but we're hanging on and we're holding on. This is my business, my marriage, my children, my church, my name, my fame. And God says, let it go. Untie the young, unused animal and put it to my purposes. And I'm preaching to friends online, but I'm also speaking to you in the house. Would you agree that there's just panic in every big decision-making room out there? And Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Friends, I've been there twice. It is one of the most politically, spiritually charged, the most politically and spiritually charged cities in the world. The most contested for real estate in the world, Jerusalem. The center of the world. God's holy city. And Jesus rides in on a donkey, into the most politically charged, most irrational, most unhealthy dynamic between different people, groups, and subgroups, and multiples of the subgroup and preferences, and he gets on the donkey and he walks in as the king of peace. He's not intimidated by the news highlights. He's still walking in as king of peace. The question is, have we untied the vehicles that he's entrusted to us to carry him into the world so that we can bring peace. Do you remember the um, story in the Old Testament? Uh, there was Moses and the spies, 12 of them, and God sent them into the promised land to go and spy at the promised land, and two legends came back, Joshua and Caleb, and 10 of them, not us. And when that story happens, do you remember? Every spa was mentioned by name. Everyone. We know the details of the spas under Moses that went into the promised land to spy it out. And then God says, look, a whole bunch of you are not going to make it. I'm sorry, guys, but you came, lack of faith problem. And so Joshua is going to rise up, and he's going to go into the promised land. And what does Joshua do? He sends spies as well into Jericho to go and spy it out. But in the Joshua story, they're not named. In human efforts, 
Remember Moses' generation? They did everything they could to live up to the Ten Commandments. Broke them every day. Just like you and I. Someone feeling very healthy in church right now. I look down the aisle thinking, yep, you heard what he said. Pastor said you are just like I. And under Moses' generation, produced by human effort and performance, the spies are listed by name because who you are matters and how you do matters. In Joshua's generation, spies aren't mentioned by name. Joshua is a picture of Christ, and this story is all about him. Only one name. And so the spies go in to bring back good reports from the city of Jericho. We don't even know who they are, and we don't care. And here we are in the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, which happened, I tried to figure out with my kids this morning, 2000, and we just went plus years ago. And Jesus walks in and he says, untie the colt to two disciples. Luke wrote this story. Luke was a doctor. He wanted detail, doctor's detail. I don't want to miss a detail. When Luke writes, go and read his book from the beginning, he starts Jesus' story at Adam. He's like, I want to track this right back to the first man, and we're going to start this. We're not going to miss a detail. Now he's in Jerusalem. It's kind of coming to the end of Jesus on earth with his disciples, and Luke says, yeah, they were just two guys. They walked in to say, whoa, Luke, that's not who you are. Now I'm getting it now. It's making sense to me now. We keep trying to see where we fit in the story and how, how, how he did and she did. And man, their faith is huge. And they did really big things. And man, they're parenting. And they're sure, you know, as young guys, we're just ranking. I just, I just, uh, and, and Luke says, you, you know, it's so cool. He doesn't need a name. He just needs you to say yes. And to go and unlock the things he's given you to his glory. And we live in a generation, can I just be honest? Not a young generation. I'm talking about all of us alive on the planet today. So if you're 85, welcome to the youth. But we live in a generational moment in time where names really matter. We vote for names. We follow names. We, we walk into high schools. You've heard my story. Standard 4 in Schlady School. 1994, Standard 4. Desperate to get my name on the honors board. So pumped. Probably not going to make it with rugby, kept going to trials, kept never making the trials, probably not going to be my gig. I'll leave that to someone else. But squash, wow. There, there are four teams in squash, very few people go to trials, and even the D team gets colors. So I played squash in 1994. I made Natal schools. I got my bag. I got my badge. I got my name on the honors board there at Mshlali School for squash. Hey, listen, if, you, if you're into squash, thank you, love. I love you too so much. No one else clapped. No one else cares about my insecurities. <laughs> if you go to Mshlali today, you're going to see my name bright there on the board. Dylan Yana, squash, Natal Colors. <laughs> As if it freaking matters. As if your title next to CEO matters to God in the least. Do you know what matters to him? The character that put you in that position to shift the culture of the company. And I see the tussle in young people, and it's a good thing. You should fight for victory. We don't want to lose the fight, but we want to destroy the need for fame. There's only one name who's meant to be famous. And they untie the cult give it to Jesus and they back up you Jesus do with what we've given you what only you can do what we're going to do is we're going to praise you and our business you do with it Jesus what only you can do and we're going to honor you and we're going to praise you and our marriage you Jesus do with it what only you can do. And we're going to praise you. And our next generation, as they go into encounter, we're not worried about assessing where they're at and what they're doing and what's going to happen next. They've just been gifted by God. You, Jesus, take these young people and do with them what only you can do. 
and we're going to press you. Won't you stand with me, Link Church? I have a question for you today. I can ask it in two ways. What do you need to untie to him? What part of your life is tied up? It's actually quite amazing. If you read into the detail, it says the donkey will be at a crossroads. What part of you is tied up in a crossroads? And you know today that God is just saying, give it to me that I may ride that thing in peace. Give it to me that I may usher in a new season. Let me say it in a different way. Where is God calling for a transition? Because where there's transition in him, there's transformation in you. And so I've asked the team to prepare a song. I think the lyric is so apt and powerful for this moment. And they're going to sing it over us today. And as they do, I just want to ask you, just begin to say, God, untie the thing in me that's been set apart for you. God, help me to trust you. God, help me to transition the areas of my life that I hold on so tightly. I give them this Palm Sunday as I head into what others would call the Holy Week. Holy just means set apart. I set apart all these details for you. So Jesus, do what only you can do in this moment as we honor your name, as we bless you. I just pray that you would loose your people in this place. In Jesus' name.